Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and as agreed upon, we've moved into the book of Ruth in our next verse-by-verse -verse study. And so I invite everyone watching to follow us through. This is a short book and I believe that you're going to find it enlightening. I hope everyone is well out there and staying safe. I want to take a moment just to thank you all for all of your kind comments and your words of encouragement on Facebook, both on Facebook and on YouTube. And so let's begin studying the Book of Ruth. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for you allowing us to continue to worship you and to feast upon your word in this way. I just ask that you'd filter out all the foolishness of, of error, that which is not true, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Ruth is a short book. Uh, and in looking at all the literature that you you run into the same situation you do in almost every study of one of the books of the Bible and and that's the tremendous amount of space that's given uh, regarding authorship you know who wrote the book and any number of people have suggested you know, uh, different various authors of the book. Uh, you know, there's no problem with Matthew, Mark, or Luke, or John, and uh, or Paul. But it seems evident to everybody that Ruth didn't write this book. And once again, I take the position that I have always taken, that the author is the Holy Spirit. I don't know who he used, who God used to write Ruth, but I do know that the author was the Holy Spirit. Now, many people suggest that it was Samuel. I just don't know. And I believe that it was the Holy Spirit, and I believe it's imperative that we be careful with this book. Because I believe that you, we can spiritualize any passage of Scripture. But I believe as long as the lesson that you draw you know, from it, as long as it isn't contrary to what God has revealed in His Word, I believe without question, uh, its, its primary purpose is to give us information concerning the lineage of David. Now, I mean, if we did not have the book of Ruth, folks, if we didn't have this book, then we wouldn't have any idea about David's lineage. And so that's one of the purposes, I believe, of the book. I believe that there's another purpose in the book, and that is to highlight the process of the kinsman redeemer, which is the very basis of our redemption in addition to that I want you to realize that this book is about three departures from the city of Bethlehem and and three births in the city of Bethlehem if we look at the departures you'll remember that there was a Levi who was interested in finding a priest and he found one in Micah as he left his situation and he went to Bethlehem and there he in Bethlehem there he set up a false center of worship and he left Bethlehem taking Micah with him into the northern parts of Israel that was an individual named Jonathan and Jonathan, as many of you know, Jonathan was a grandson of Moses. And for a long time, there was idolatrous worship, uh, the worship of idols 
instituted by this Levi that left the city of Bethlehem. And then there was the Levite in Judges 19. Now, you may remember his story. His concubine left him and he went and found her uh, at the city of Bethlehem where she had returned and he took her from Bethlehem. And in that area, she was terribly used and left for dead. If you remember, he, he cut her up and he sent parts of her to all the tribes in Israel. And he said, he said, this horrible thing has happened in Israel. And as a result, all, of, uh, all in Israel assembled against the tribe of Benjamin, uh, which is Bethlehem, and destroyed all but 600 of them. It was a terrible time in Israel's history. So we have two departures from Bethlehem that had evil consequences. And in this book, we have the third departure from Bethlehem, and that is Elimelech. Elimelech. It's pronounced Elimelech. Elimelech and his family. Then we had three births in this city. There was Rachel, who was far along in her pregnancy, and at Bethlehem, she gave birth to Benjamin. And when she died, she called him the son of her sorrow. But Jacob called him the son of his might, or, or the son of his right hand. Now, whether Jacob in his human frame understood this or not, I don't know, but surely a beautiful picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, <clears throat> and then there's Ruth. There's Ruth marrying Boaz and having Obad. So the second birth is Obad that is recorded here in the Scriptures at the city of Bethlehem. And then the third I'm sure you're all familiar with, the Lord Jesus Christ by the Virgin Mary. So Bethlehem has a central point or a, or a central uh, importance in our biblical study. So we, be, we begin chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The Jew connects the book of Ruth with the book of Judges. It's, it's one book as far as the Jews are concerned. The time when the, the Bible was canonized, and, 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 I, and I'm sure, absolutely positive, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, came two books. But, but this is in the time when the judges ruled. There was a famine in the land. There was a famine in the land. It was during this time that no temple had been established at Jerusalem. There was no central point of worship. It was at that time that every man did what was right in his own eyes. We call that anarchy. That was not worship of Jehovah. Now, I'm not suggesting that there weren't some who wanted to worship the Lord, but the history in the book of Judges is a sad, sad history. And, and if God hadn't, had not God raised up certain judges like Samson or, or Gideon, you know, it seems apparent that at, at least outside of God's sovereign control, Israel would have destroyed themselves. 
There was no, there wasn't any central point of worship. There wasn't any central figure around whom to worship. You know, as we have the Lord Jesus Christ, and every man, every man did what was right in his own eyes. The result was famine. Now, I'm sure that our verse is referring, first of all, to a physical famine in the land. Those had happened before. The, that's no reason to flee the promised land. That's no reason to leave the place where God had placed them. And I believe there's a spiritual application to that, of that to us today. Elimelech did. The Jews fled the land of Israel. If you remember, they, they looked to Egypt for help. They looked to, uh, they looked to Syria for help. They wound up in captivity with every man doing what was right in his own eyes. There was famine in the land. Not only physical famine, but spiritual famine. That's why I believe it's a wonderful thing to realize that God has given Himself in our place. We have one to worship, and we have a canon, a completed canon. We have a standard. We feast upon His Word. We're able to come together and feast upon His Word. And I think one of the great problems in the human race today is that there isn't that standard. You know, it, it, it seems as though, you know, well, there's lots of approaches to God and everybody has their different idea about God and, you know, and, and that's okay. You know, or we ought to be understanding of other people's beliefs. And there isn't any standard. And, I, and folks, I have pointed out time and time again how that the Word of God is very dogmatic. It's very precise. It is a standard. I know that He's a jealous God. I know that He guards His honor and His glory jealously. And Israel had no standard in the time of the judges. And much of so-called Christianity today has no standard. We can't make up our own idea of God. God is who He, who he is. God is who He has revealed Himself to be in this book. I didn't make Him up. And I, I can guarantee you if I had, He would have probably been different than the one I see in this book. I've spoken at other times about the fact that if we define Christianity as some religion that 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 just you know that preaches love and understanding and compassion and helping one another, then we don't need Christ. We don't need the death on the cross. We don't need his resurrection. One of the leading German theologians said that that it was of little importance to him whether Jesus Christ ever really actually ever existed or not. Because, because of all the wonderful truths in Christianity of love and, and compassion and, and, and forgiveness and understanding and so on and so forth. And that's not true. First of all, in the, in the law, God gave Israel a standard. Not that they could keep the law, but they knew the righteousness of God through God giving them the law. They knew what it was. They had something that they could clearly understand. Their God was a righteous God. And He revealed Himself to them in the law. And I've pointed out in, in numerous other studies that how the law was not a means of redemption. 
not, not for justification or sanctification. It was a revelation of the righteousness of God and the depravity of man. So they had to turn to Christ. The justified man, the man made righteous, lives by God's faithfulness. What a marvelous biblical truth. There was a famine in the land, and so he fled. Rather than stay there as a bastion of truth, as one who could be an ambassador for the Jehovah that he knew, he left. He left. And his name was Elimelech. And I believe that God did choose names for a very definite purpose. There's very little argument about the, the meaning of the name Elimelech. Almost everybody agrees that, that if we just translate the Hebrew, it means, his name means, my God is king. But he's not living like that. He hadn't learned in, in whatsoever state he was therewith to be content. He hadn't learned that God knows the way that He takes. And when He hath tested him, He would come forth as gold. And so, He fled God's country. He went to a terrible country. I mean, He went to Moab of all places. Many of you are probably familiar with the history of Moab. Noah was drunk after the flood and his daughter seduced him, unknowing to him. We had two children, Moab and Ammon, and terrible, terrible pronouncements have been made by God Almighty about or against both Moab and Ammon. And that's what he did. He went across the other side of, of the, the, uh, the Dead Sea, southern end of the Dead Sea, into the land of Moab, a place that God had cursed. I believe the lesson clearly is that when we leave God's place, there is no second. There isn't a place that, well, it's, it's almost God's place. You know, this is almost as good as it ought to be. Leaving Bethlehem put him in Moab. The land of blessing, the house of bread, became the land of cursing. Bethlehem means house of bread. And his name means my God is king. But he didn't act that way. And he was married to a woman, Naomi. Her name basically means delightful, sweet, or, or the one of my delight. There, there's several ways that you could translate it, but we have, we have quite a couple here. here. Here we've got, we have, my God is king, Married to delightful, you know, and and many men who have been married for a long time say no such woman exists. And they have two children. Now, if we literally translate their names, I think Elimelech and Naomi had a couple of sick kids. Consumption or destruction. Depends on how you, you interpret that Hebrew word. And sickly. Now, I don't, I, don't wanna, I don't mean to stress the meaning of the words at all. I simply bring that up because they're not going to live very long. And that seems to be indicated in their names. Apparently, these two sons were not well. So he went into the country of Moab, and there he settled down. Your Bible says in the 
in the second verse that he continued there. Apparently he wasn't homesick. Apparently uh, there was nothing in this individual whose, whose name is my God is King led him to 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 want to return to God's country. Now I'm absolutely certain. I, 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 I'm in no way departing from my position on the sovereignty of God. I've mentioned this before. I don't think there's anyone who believes in the sovereignty of God as much as me. But I believe this is in God's plan. It's the motive that God looks at for reward or lack of reward. You'll remember in, in Isaiah, he says, I'm going to call the Assyrian. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell the Assyrian to use a rod of, of chastisement, a sword against my people Israel, to destroy them and cut them off. And what did the Assyrian do? Well, he did, he did just what God said. He did that. I mean, what else could he do? God is sovereign. God said, that's what I'm going to have him do. And it shouldn't surprise you that he did it. And then God says, I'm going to judge him. And, and you say, now, now Steve, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, this question of, of the sovereignty of God, you know, it's always bothered me. You know, if God is sovereign, then how can this Assyrian be responsible? What, or, or any man, how can any man be responsible? What right does God have to judge that Assyrian for doing exactly what God said He was going to have him do? You know, there's a number of biblical critics who say, you know, that's not right. You know, why, why is the man held responsible in judgment for doing exactly what God ordained that he should do? And God's answer is very simple. There was a problem with his heart. He enjoyed what he did. He wasn't judged for what he did. That is not what Isaiah 14 says. He was judged for his attitude. I'm absolutely certain that Elimelech is exactly where God ordained that he should be. If he hadn't been, there wouldn't be a Ruth. There wouldn't be a Boaz. And more importantly, there wouldn't be the kingly line of David if this were not true. But Elimelech's responsibility is his attitude. Is he there? Is Elimelech there rejoicing in the Lord? No. No. Clearly from the text, he's decided to stay in Moab. Because we know in just a, a, a few verses that things are a lot better back in Bethlehem. Things are going great. But he stays in Moab and he dies. Verse 3. Now we don't know how long this was, but it, but it couldn't have been a great number of years. <clears throat> and so Naomi, now, she's left with her two sons, sickly and consumptive. So here she is in a cursed country, away from God's country, left with two sick kids. And these two boys, they took wives of the women of Moab, which they were commanded not to do. Clear breach of the law. Clearly, God had indicated that Moab was cursed. That was clear in the book of Judges. But they took wives there. Again, we see the sovereignty of God at work in their lives. And the name of one of these women was Orpah. Now some say it means gazelle. If you look at the root word, it means stubborn. Though the, the, the original translation of the Hebrew word is gazelle. I'm going with the root word, stubborn. 
and Ruth was married to Chilion, and Ruth means friendly, friendship, and they dwelled there about 10 years. So I'm, I'm assuming that they've been married about 10 years. And then they die. They had made that place their home. They had decided, they, they dwelled there. They had decided that it was perfectly acceptable to settle down permanently in an area that God had cursed. We do know that, that Israel is going to leave the land. God's going to drive them out because they're dis disobedient to Him. There's this spiritual famine in the land. You know, they'd rather look to Egypt than they would to God. And they're going to be driven out. And they're going to be uh, they're going to be out of the land for a period of testing. The day will come when God's going to regather them. And I'd I'd be I'd be derelict in my duty here if I didn't point out in the in the book of Ruth that at least one of the indications is that Israel is out of the land and eventually will come back into the land after a period of testing. So they dwell there about 10 years and now sickly and consumptive die. And now Naomi is left you know, with with just her, she she's uh, well, she's lost her, her, both her husband and her two kids, and she's left with two daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab to go back to Bethlehem or Judah, because she had heard in the country of Moab how the Lord had visited His people in giving them bread. One of the beautiful pictures in the Word of God is that Israel was Jehovah's wife. So I, I find it interesting that I can't help but find it interesting that the one responsible before the law, Elimelech, is dead and now Naomi's coming back. And I believe this is a beautiful picture of Israel's return because because Israel, or Naomi, is not happy in the land where she is. She has no men folk there. She has no family. She probably has some, uh, surely she met a few friends, but she has no relatives there. And it was very, very important for inheritance for the lineage of her family that she have relatives, that she stay within her tribe so that the inheritance not be scattered and she's going to return to Bethlehem from where she had left and I think it is a a beautiful picture of Israel's returning and being driven back because of their condition in exile Now we know that God says He's going to send a restlessness among them. And He's going to gather them from all the nations where He's driven them. I think we have a beautiful picture of that return of Israel. And Ruth represents the Gentiles that are part of those who are gathered from all nations, kindred, tribe, and tongue. She had heard that the Lord had visited His people and given them bread. God, who gave them the bread. The God who gave us His Word. What a wonderful privilege to fellowship together in the study of His Word and feast upon it, the bread of life. So, they went out 
of the place where she was, where her husband had settled her and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. Now we have a widow with two other widows. Keep in mind here that Ruth is linked with Naomi. She takes Naomi's place in continuing the family of Elimelech these two women give a fitting picture of the two phases of Israel's history two phases the phase of abandoning their God and losing their inheritance and the yet future phase of restoration through the Jewish remnant. Now, as disappointing as this may sound to some of you who look forward to this study, the church, on the other hand, will never take Israel's place. Ruth is, uh, Ruth is a Moabitess, so she has no claim to the national rights and privileges of Israel. I believe this illustrates the fact that Israel has forfeited all its rights and the remnant will be accepted on the basis of pure grace. Pure grace. The church, on the other hand, is never called a widow. I mean, uh, folks, this term only applies to Israel and the remnant according to Isaiah. You know, I, I hate to jump ahead. I, I really do. But, you know, contrary to those who find it irresistible to write the church into this book, at least at this point, I don't see that at all. And, and I think that by doing that, what, we, we meant, we, what happens is we miss seeing the beauty of the symbolism that is there. I hate jumping ahead, but we'll see in chapter 4, chapter 4, if you hang with me that long through this, that the relatives attribute Ruth's child to Naomi. In other words, it's, it's in Ruth that Naomi is blessed. So it will be for the nation of Israel. A time will come when they will be blessed as a nation, but only because a remnant from among them turns to Christ. And the, the genealogy at the end of Ruth 4 establishes a link between Israel and Egypt and the establishment of the kingdom under David. And this fits perfectly with the prophetic interpretation of the book. God's intervention in grace on behalf of Israel, Naomi, in the form of a remnant returning to Christ so that ultimately Christ can reign over them as king. Verse 8, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that ye may find rest, verse 9, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. Verse 10, And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. They both said, We'll go back with you and we'll go back to your people. We know from the account that one of them does and one of them doesn't. We know that Amelamech was a wealthy man. We know that. So we have a beautiful illustration of Israel's condition out of the land. They're out of the land, but, but they have a fabulous heritage. 
They're God's people. My God is King. Elimelech. The name also infers that he was a man of, of great stature, a man of uh, great power. We know that when they come back into the land, and, and I hate to jump ahead again, but Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz is a near kinsman. He's a mighty man, a wealthy man. And there are some who say that, that Boaz was a very close relative of, of Elimelech. I mean, some have even suggested a brother. So he's a very wealthy man. And the indication clearly, clearly, the indication is that Elimelech is part of that family. Why stay in Moab? Why dwell there? I'm not going to say it was abject poverty because I don't know that, but it's an area of cursing and it's, it's an area that's distant from his family and from his inheritance. And that's where Israel is. That's where they're at. That's where they're at today. I recognize that there's a, there's a smattering of recalling to, to the land of Israel. You know, if I read my Bible and, and if I take God at face value, the day will come when there will be a restlessness among Israel which will drive them back to the land. Drive them back. You talk to a Jew in Oklahoma and you say, well, hey, you want to go back to Israel? You know, they'll think you're crazy. I mean, they don't mind sending some money back there, but, but most every Jew that I've talked to does not want to go back. And that is going to change. I think, I'll know, I think I know what it'll take to change it. That's another video. But, but, but Israel is going to be driven back into the land just as Naomi was. Who's going to take care of her? She doesn't have a single relative in Moab other than her two daughters-in-laws and their families. And their families, are, I'm sure, are not going to take care of Naomi. And if we look carefully at the situation, she's being forced, 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 folks, back to her land. And that day will come when Israel is going to be forced back to the land. However, in the book of Isaiah, we're told that God's going to use Israel to reach the Gentiles. And so many have concluded that, well, Ruth, well, Ruth must be a picture of those Gentile nations. And, and most Bible commentators would say that Ruth is a picture of the church. I don't know if it's, I should say most, but many. I'm not willing to go there, at least not yet. Mainly because what she's doing is urging them to stay there. They both said no. That they'd go with her. And then she asked them to think about it. I mean, you know, why are you going to do that? In my land, in my land, I have, I have to raise up a son who will marry you to raise up seed for his brother. You know, they didn't have Social Security and, and, and Medicare and, you know, and, uh, EBT cards or food stamps or, or whatever. And God, I think, arranged a beautiful program where the family took care of the family and the inheritance was in the family. We don't do that now. We don't do that now. You know, so God raises up a government, you know, to tax us to death so that we're forced to do it. But if we did it God's way, we wouldn't have the needy. We wouldn't have the situation that we have 
in our country today or in our world today? I believe absolutely it's because we don't do it God's way. And when a man married a woman, there was, there was a portion of the inheritance. And if he died, she didn't get it. There wasn't any seed that would carry on that right in the family inheritance. And so God said that a brother had to raise up seed to his brother. Now that that means that uh, when, when Tamar's husband died, Tamar, while her husband lived, had a part in the inheritance of the tribe of Judah. When her husband died, Tamar is now nothing more than a daughter-in-law. So, a brother should marry her, give her a child, and that child's inheritance had nothing to do with the father. It went to the husband that had died. That's why, why Onan spilled his seed on the ground because he didn't want that part. He didn't want that part of the inheritance leaving him and going to his dead brother. And that was the problem. That was the problem with Tamar. Any child born would not legally be considered his heir. The next statement there in the in, after, says that Onan did evil and that God slew him. And that's the way it was. And, and what we're seeing here is what, what Naomi is saying to her daughter-in-laws is, you know, man, you got a problem. I don't have any other kids that can marry you and raise up seed and give you an inheritance in the land where I'm going. You don't have any inheritance in that land. You don't have any part or parcel in that land. When I die, you ain't going to have anything. Since I don't have any other kids, well, okay, there's another option. All right, you could wait around until I have a son, you know, and he grows up and can marry. You know, you're 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 going to be 80, and he's going to be 17. It's not gonna, exactly going to be something that he likes, but but you know, you're not going to want to wait around. You're not going to want to wait. You wouldn't do that. There's no hope for you in this land. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. The only way any Gentile could worship the Lord God Jehovah in the Old Testament was through a Jewish priest. It was that thing that, that led Schofield to say that that the means of redemption in the Old Testament was keeping the law. Of course, that's not true. But the lesson in the Old Testament is that a mediator was required and that mediator was typed in the priests and it was fulfilled in Christ. So there's no hope for these girls in God's land. They don't have any hope. Naomi's not going to have any more kids. Apparently, she's uh, suggesting, uh, and that's not clear in the text, whether she's too old to have children. What she is saying is even if she did marry somebody and have kids, they wouldn't wait around. It'd be too long. And you don't want to miss the point in the book of Ruth. The picture Naomi is presenting to her daughters-in-law is hopelessness. 
We'll pick up here next time. I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for watching. Stay safe out there. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.